Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Today we've got a special birthday episode. Um, I am turning 50, so just to let you know, this show is brought to you by Gluten Free Society. This weekend we have our biggest annual sale of the year. It's 20% off of any of our supplemental products and you can um, use the coupon code CELEBRATE to take advantage of that and celebrate my 50th with me. So. Let's dive in. Today we're talking about a uh, follow-up from, from Tuesday's show on yeast overgrowth and what causes yeast overgrowth, what are the symptoms, etc. So if you've got questions pertaining to that, we're going to do our best to get those answered during the show. We've got a bunch of questions that have already come in from our viewers, and so don't be afraid to say hi and ask your question, and uh, let's get started. So we've got, um, let's see here, P17, can you have yeast on your tongue absolutely and i don't know if we we probably can't throw that image of it maybe we can i don't know there's a there's an image we have it's one of the worst cases i've ever seen in my practice of uh yeast overgrowth on the tongue but it's very much possibility for yeast to grow on the tongue the, the name for that if you want to look it up and and read more about it's called oral thrush t-h-r-u-s-h okay would yeast shield help with toenail fungus uh, coming from victoria so possibly, um, yeast shield has a number of different antifungal herbals um, that, that can work very, very well. But with a lot of times with toenail fungus, um, you know, you want to take it from a dual approach. You want to take it from an inside out approach, but you also want to take it from a direct application or a topical application approach. One of the most effective ways to deal with fungal overgrowth uh, inside the, the nail bed is to soak the nail in hydrogen peroxide, like a 3% hydrogen peroxide. You can buy that over the counter at most uh, grocery stores or, or pharmacies. Uh, but in addition, using yeast shield um, may be very helpful in that kind of combination. But you also have to remember what we talked about on Tuesday, which is what causes yeast overgrowth in the first place and so a big one is excessive carbohydrates, sugar, antibiotic use, uh, alcohol use. These are all triggers or causes of, of what can do it. So if you're going to embark upon trying to get rid of yeast naturally, you've really got to address those areas and you've got to adjust your diet and your lifestyle around it. Otherwise, it's very hard to kill them if you're still feeding them. Um, let's see here. Angelo says, had oral thrush since last November comes and goes. What should I do? No meds worked. I'm sure alcohol is not helping. Well, yeah, I think you hit it on the head, Angelo. Alcohol is one of the big triggers for persistence in yeast overgrowth for multiple reasons. Alcohols, most alcohols have a lot of sugar in them, and that's yeast food. But alcohol is also an immunosuppressant, so it suppresses the immune system. And so remember, your immune system is your, is your best bet at fighting uh, overgrowth, yeast overgrowth. And so if it's weakened by daily consumption of alcohol, you're gonna really struggle with being successful. Can severe yeast overgrowth cause nerve damage or shoulder pain? I'll be getting a DNA stool test soon to check for all infections. Don't get a DNA stool test. Those are a waste of money. Um, the DNA testing, the PCR stool testing, um, Tons of false positives on tests like that. They're not super helpful. Go back down, I'm, um, just a little right there. Um, but to answer your question, can yeast overgrowth cause nerve damage? Yes. Remember, yeast can mimic gluten. Uh, that's one of the components that, that, remember, gluten predominantly is a neurological toxin. And so for many people with gluten sensitivity, they go on and develop neuropathy and, and nerve damage. So yeast definitely can do the same thing. Um, part two of that question is, can it cause shoulder pain? It, yes, it can, especially on the right side because yeast, remember yeast can ferment the food that you eat. If you eat carbohydrates, the yeast will take the carbohydrates that you consume and they will turn those carbohydrates into alcohol. Your gut becomes a wine factory and that wine now has to be dealt with. The, the alcohol and the acetaldehyde from the byproduct of alcohol now have to be metabolized by your liver. And so what happens to a lot of people is they start to take on liver damage. And that liver can refer pain, to the, especially on the right side, to the shoulder area. So it's very common to see that be the case. Okay. Let's go down on that side. 
Would, uh, Melanie wants to know, would two ounces of dry red wine with dinner still affect yeast? Yeah, it will, it will definitely hinder your recovery. I would, you know, if you've got a yeast issue or suspect you have a yeast issue, you've got to come to terms with alcohols out. It's got to be out. Otherwise, you, you won't win. I mean, I've seen this time and time and time again. As a matter of fact, I had a, a gentleman yesterday um, in my practice where, where he was, he was, he'd been at trying to kill a yeast overgrowth for over a year. And um, one of the things that he would not put down is alcohol. And he was, he was drinking wine regularly and he was unsuccessful no matter what he took, no matter what supplements he took, no matter what drugs from his other doctor he took, he was not successful because alcohol um, was an interfering factor in a major one. So if you're if you're struggling with yeast, you know know that one of your top priorities is to cut alcohol out. Let's see. Can you have yeast as a result of smoking? Um, smoking suppresses the immune system, and so smokers definitely are at a greater risk for that type of imbalance. So you know it's always a good idea to put down the cigarettes. Okay. Don't miss one, go up just a hair. Oh, here it is. Thoughts on oregano oil for yeast? Um, oregano oil can be a, can be a very good um, supplement to take. It, it has very strong antifungal properties. I can just share with you my experience. So anytime we're talking about a single herb or, or um, natural product, to try to combat or, or balance yeast. Sometimes different strains or species of yeast have resistances to, to things. And I've seen many times where, because in, in my practice, we do what's called culture sensitivity, where if we find yeast, we then try to determine what will kill it by exposing that yeast to different things, and oregano being one of those. And so in my experience, most of the people I see, probably 80% or more, have oregano resistance. The yeast that's growing, or the overgrowth that they have, has an oregano resistance. So although oregano can be helpful in many cases, it also, a lot of times, uh, the yeast growing in a person might be resistant to just the oregano. This is why I like uh, the general recommendation of a broad spectrum if you don't know. So, so you know, again, a supplement like Yeast Shield to support microbiome balance is a broad spectrum is multiple ingredients. It's not just one thing because generally speaking, if we use more than one, the likelihood that the yeast will be resistant to all of those different ingredients is reduced. Um, how long would you recommend using yeast shield assuming a person has a yeast issue? It's different for different people, but um, you know, when, I, when I'm generally working with a client, um, we do 10 week protocols. So, so 10 weeks generally is enough time. Some people can do it faster. And it, I think a lot of it, Kevin, depends on how well you're following the other tenets of good health. Again, low sugar, low carbohydrate during the process, no alcohol during the process, no exposure to non-organic foods because of the pesticide uh, that can act as antibiotics in the GI tract. So you, you have to stick to those other things. And then, and then the time framing of you know, how long to take yeast shield will vary from person to person, number one, based on how aggressive the yeast is uh, and the overgrowth, based on any resistances that are present and based on other behaviors that a person might have around their immune system. Where I see some of the more challenging cases where people generally tend to struggle, even though they're doing a lot of the right things, is because they have something that in their behavior or in their environment that is suppressing, long-term suppressing their immune system's ability to, to recover. And so a perfect example of that would be chronic external mold exposure. So, you know, mold in somebody's home creating, again, that immunosuppression leading to the inability to adequate, for the immune system to adequately fight. Thoughts on Pau d'Arco and Neem? I think, I think the same thing there. They're, they're both great, but if you have a yeast that's resistant to them, then they may not be. And so, um, again, I'm not a fan of single uh, single approaches or, or, or single herb application in this process. I, I, I like broad spectrum if you don't have a culture telling you what your yeast is sensitive to. Uh, question about kefir. Um, if you're on a yeast protocol, 
you shouldn't consume any fermented food where sugars are being used in the fermentation process because there's always sugar residue left over, which means carbohydrate. And so kefir in this case is not something I would recommend. Uh, if you want fermented food so that you can get good food that contain good healthy bacteria, probably uh, fermented vegetables would be a better option. So things like sauerkraut, fermented um, cauliflower, fermented carrots, those would be better overall better options. But kombucha is a big no-no. A lot of people think kombucha is a health drink. It's junk. It's sugar water with alcohol in it. It's not good for you. Don't recommend it. And kefir, uh, kefir is a ferment where they use the dairy and the dairy sugar. And so dairy is out during, if you're trying to get rid of yeast, you really want to scale back any dairy consumption, including yogurts, in an attempt to be successful. So like, what are the top three? I think I'll answer this question. What are the top three things that you need to avoid if you're trying to control a yeast overgrowth in your diet, right? So number one, you need to avoid grain, any grain, and that includes oats, that includes corn and rice, not just the, the, you know, the classic you know, wheat, barley, rye, and oats, but the other grains as well. Um, the other thing you want to avoid is any sugar, uh, processed sugar. I don't care if it's organic or not. If it's processed sugar, you want to avoid it. The other thing you absolutely want to avoid is all dairy. Those things are a must, right? And then, of course, add to that alcohol and then add to that as well dried fruits. You don't want any dried fruits. So like if you're, if you're eating raisins or dates or mangoes that are dried or dried cherries, these are things that are just basically what you've done is you've concentrated, um, you've shrunk the size of the fruit in a very small amount so that you've concentrated the quantity of sugar. And usually people tend to overeat dried fruit and it provides a huge amount of sugar uh, for, for yeast populations to thrive and grow on. Um, let's see, what test to find out about low stomach acid? If, well, if you're talking about like a test in a doctor's office, one of the tests that, that can be done is a, is a pH endoscopy. It's where you swallow a capsule and it sends radio signals back to a computer and tells you about the pH as it traverses through your GI tract. So that, that is one way. Now, some people will do um, the baking soda tests, or they'll take actual um, betaine hydrochloride, and 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 they'll basically it's not really a test because you're just kind of feeling how you feel, uh, whether you burp or whether you have um, a burning sensation in your stomach. That's those are subjective. It's not that they can't be helpful, but again, if you want a real objective way of measuring stomach acid, a pH endoscopy is is probably the most accurate way to do that. Is there a connection between yeast overgrowth and toenail fungus? Yes, toenail fungus is a type of yeast overgrowth. It's just occurring on the toenails. And that says, so what do we eat? I assume you mean when I said cut out grain, dairy, sugar, and dried fruit and alcohol, what do you eat? You eat meat, you eat vegetables, you eat nuts, you eat, you eat small amounts of low glycemic fruit. And again, it's not a forever diet. You're not staying restricted for the rest of your days, but you're trying... You know, I like analogies. Maybe you can imagine if you've ever had a stray cat come to your doorstep, as long as you put out food, the cat keeps coming back. It never goes away. Well, if you want the cat to go away, quit putting food out for it. And it's the same thing with yeast. If you want the yeast to go away, quit feeding them. And that's why you have to restrict your diet initially. Okay. Let's see here. I'm having trouble. Uh, well, that's not really easy. Well, we'll answer it. Having trouble with my bile ducts. What can I do to get bile working properly? Well, this depends on, on whether or not you have a blockage in your bile duct. You know, people can form gallstones or, or, or um, you know, crystals can, can precipitate out from the bile and block the bile duct from dumping bile into the small intestine. And so that, if that's happening, there are gall flushes that can be done. Um, but, but supplementally, what can you do? Bitters, especially in your diet. You know, dandelion is an example of a, of a good bitter. Bitters stimulate contractility and bile flow. And so those are things that can be used. Taurine is great for that. Um, vitamin C is also great to support that. One of the, one of the things that I, I have people do um, is take something called Lipogest. And what that is, is it's a, it's a, um, it's a supplement that supports 
uh, fat digestion when the gallbladder is either absent, so like a, somebody's got a surgical removal of their gallbladder or they're struggling with their gallbladder to do its work properly. But ultimately, what do you do with a gallbladder that's not functioning properly is you ask the right question, which is why is it not functioning properly? And there's a thousand answers to that question. And so that's where you just work with a really good doctor who can help you understand not so much what to call it, but why the problem is happening. Is, de is desiccated thyroid better than the synthetic for a person who has their thyroid gland removed? It depends. It's very unique to the person. So, I mean, my experience is some people I've seen do really well, you know, on medicines like levothyroxine and Synthroid and others better on things like um, Armor or Tyrosint. It's very uni unique and individualistic. I, I think if we try to get into the, to the whole realm of generalizing um, we can run into trouble because it's, one is not right for all. So Juan's asking, I got a migraine consuming organic grain-free nutritional yeast. Why would that be? Well, many people are actually allergic to nutritional yeast. Uh, I see it all the time when we do our testing. Uh, and so that could be one of the reasons why. And, and um, you know, so, so a lot of folks use kind of n nutritional yeast as, a, as an aid in their cooking uh, or as a, as a kind of a supplemental to get more B vitamins in the diet. But there are a lot of people that react to, to the nutritional yeasts. It's one of the reasons why, you know, you've, you've probably heard me say this before. It's not something I recommend, especially if you're new to the no grain, no pain diet. Generally speaking, you want to try to avoid that as, as one of the things to avoid for the first several months, at least six months, as you're embarking on trying to restore your health. So the question is, so it's not a good idea to take antibiotics for surgery associated with dental implant before signs uh, of infection and culture and testing. I think the question here is, you know, I was talking on Tuesday about, um, you, you know, how people, how dentists, just in case they prescribe an antibiotic because, you know, because they're wanting to prevent the possibility of a bacterial infection uh, while performing an oral surgery. And, and so, you know, I can't make that decision for you. That really is something you need to talk with your doctor about. But I'm not, I'm personally not a fan of taking antibiotics just in case without the actual presence of a bacterial infection. Because let's say you did have a complication from surgery and you did get an infection. Well, that's the time afterwards to take the antibiotics. But just to take it before, in my opinion, is, is, not, you know, is, is not necessarily the best idea, especially when there's so many things that you can do to prepare for a surgery nutritionally to support your immune system's ability to, to fly through a surgery. I mean, we have, in our, in, our, in our practice, we have what, what we call pre and post surgical protocols that we put in place nutritionally to support people's recovery and to help with immune system support so that, that we can reduce some of those, try to reduce some of those risks. Um, when fungus is visible on large areas of the body, if coconut oil, tea tree oil, and vinegar is applied topically and herbs are eaten, what could be done to prevent die-off circulating through the through the blood-brain barrier. I, well, one, I would question whether or not you, you're getting die off through the blood-brain barrier, but um, Michael, what I would say, if you're trying to just basically reduce the, the potential for a Herxheimer or detox response, we have something called MycoBinder. It's a binding agent and it's it's got different ingredients, different binders in it that can help to um, alleviate and bind some of those um, byproducts as you're trying to kill off the yeast. So some of you are asking about what about coconut sugar if you're trying to follow a yeast-free diet. I don't recommend any sugars, including coconut sugar, including honey, and including maple. Now, there's one exception to the rule with honey. There's a type of honey. Um, it's, it's native to New Zealand called manuka honey, and it actually has been shown to have antifungal properties. So that would be an exception to the rule. But if you're trying to get rid of yeast, you, know, you don't want coconut sugar either. You don't want any forms. Of, of sugar, you're, you're trying to starve it out. Um, Nikki wants to know, how reliable is a blood test for candida? Not very. 
I mean, it, it can be helpful, but it's, it, it's not one that I would rely on. If you're talking about antibody testing, so if you're, if you're asking, you know, like generally speaking, uh, doctors doing a blood test for candida, what they're measuring is something called IgG uh, and sometimes IgA. So IgG or IgA antibodies to candida specifically, right? And so these tests are designed to pick up candida albicans not other forms of candida and not other forms of mold that can also circulate like rhodotorula and geotrichum. So I mean, there are more, there's more than one type of mold and a lot of these antibody tests in the blood for candida are just specific to candida, but they also only measure IgG and IgA. And those are just two types of antibodies. There are other kinds of antibodies and other types of immune react reactions you can have against mold or yeast. And so the, again, that test can be specific for candida albicans if your body's having an IgG or IgA reaction, but it isn't specific if you don't have candida albicans and it, and it you may not be having an IgG response. So in that way, they, they, they kind of have their flaws too. So they're not, I wouldn't look at that type of test and say this is 100% reliable. Um, how does stopping prednisone create yeast overgrowth? It's not that stopping prednisone um, creates a yeast overgrowth. A um, couple things, when you're on prednisone, you're suppressing your immune system, so you're increasing the risk of developing a yeast overgrowth. When you stop prednisone, depending on how you stop, most people are told by their doctors to taper down off of prednisone. So if you were, you know, for example, taking 25 milligrams a day, you wouldn't go from 25 milligrams to zero because then you could get what's called a steroid rebound. And that steroid rebound, depending on what you were taking the steroid for, steroids are generally anti-inflammatory. So a lot of times when people have skin rashes or skin inflammation, the doctor prescribes a steroid. Person has chronic pain, the doctor prescribes a steroid. Well, when you pull that steroid away too quickly, the rash can come back. And some people perceive that to be a yeast overgrowth coming back. And it's technically, it's not. It's a, it's a steroid withdrawal symptom. So to be clear, it's, it's not necessarily a yeast issue happening when you're taking the steroid away. I would argue that taking steroids away safely and appropriately would improve your immune system's capacity to handle any kind of yeast overgrowth that you might have internally. Uh, Linda's asking, can I safely take yeast shield three times a day? Yeah, you can. I mean, the, the, the standard general amount for yeast shield, if you're, if you're just trying to be like preventative, is like one capsule a day. If you want to get real aggressive with it, you can take two of those twice a day. So you take up to four and not really have any major issues or fears. And beyond that, I would say, you know, get with your health practitioner and make sure that that it's not interfering with something else like any other of the prescription medications if you're on them or anything else. Cheryl's asking, how do you know if you have candida? Um, there's a lot of symptoms for candida. I talked more about them on Tuesday. Maybe we can put a link up to Tuesday's show for Cheryl um, on Facebook so that she can go back and watch that replay. But um, brain fog, fatigue, skin rash, irritability, mood swings, toenail fungus, um, these are all common symptoms, white on the tongue or, or uh, debris caking on the tongue, vaginal discharge can be a symptom of yeast overgrowth. So um, you can also develop chronic pain, muscle aches, uh, fatigue, fibromyalgic-like symptoms. I mean, so there's a, a long battery of symptoms that, that yeast can cause that, you know, if you're suspecting that that's playing a role in, in your issue that, you know, you can look out for. Uh, let's see, Jamie's asking about the link for what, Jamie? Jamie says, where's the link for this? Um, help me understand what you mean, Jamie, the link for um, Yeast Shield, the link for the last show. We'll just put both of those up in the feed for you. Is horse tail okay to take if you have a higher ALT? Yes. But you know, you certainly want if you if you're if you're struggling or worrying about your ALT being high, the number one question, Nikki, is why is it high? Um, ALT, for those of you who don't know, it's a it's a common blood test, alanine aminotransferase, ALT for short. It's a test that doctors will take your blood and look at this marker because if it's elevated, it can be an indicator that your liver is fatty or that your liver is being damaged. And so, you know, if you already have a higher ALT, you know, you should be asking why. Now, one of the side effects of a yeast overgrowth is elevations in ALT and AST. So remember, yeast can ferment your carbohydrates, produce alcohol, that alcohol can subsequently damage your liver. 
there's a there's a term in medicine it's called auto brewery syndrome it's where your yeast overgrowth is so bad that you're creating so much alcohol that you're actually damaging your liver consistently and so a lot of times a yeast overgrowth is part of why the liver enzymes are elevated but um, you know if you're if yours is elevated and you're worried about horsetail then the best thing to do is as you're taking it just every couple of months ask your doctor to measure to make sure your your ALT is not climbing even higher can yeast cause severe lower back pain? <laughs> this is a great question, Jamie. Yes. Um, yeast, sometimes yeast can colonize in your urinary tract. And so what, what doctors oftentimes may diagnose as a, as a urinary tract infection, and then they give an antibiotic, sometimes it's actually not a, a, a bacterial infection, it's a yeast infection. And when you have a urinary tract infection, it can refer pain to your low back, creating low back pain. Right, so if you've got low back pain as a result of a yeast infection in your urinary tract or in your kidneys, um, to answer your question, yes, it absolutely can. Now, yeast can also cause generalized muscle pain in, in any muscle group of the body, so it doesn't have to just be specific to the low back, but, um, and that's just because of the inflammatory response, and so that the inflammatory antibodies can form what are called antigen antibody complexes and circulate through your, through your body and lodge into your muscle tissue and create shoulder pain and, and, and arm pain and leg pain and back pain and neck pain. So I mean, yes, yeast overgrowth can definitely contribute to, to musculoskeletal pains. For yeast in the stomach, how is the best way to get tested for it also was the best way to, to treat it? Um, to get tested for it, uh, best way is to do a, a comprehensive stool analysis to see if you have high overgrowth presence. Some doctors will do a scope and they'll find, the problem with a scope is scope's not definitive because if your doctor runs a scope, like a GI doctor, what they'll oftentimes find, because yeast are, associ are associated with something called EE, eosinophilic esophagitis, meaning that eosinophils will start to colonize your esophagus, creating damage, but this can also happen in the stomach. And so if, if you're getting a scope done, it's not specific for yeast. It just tells you that you have that as a problem. Like a scope can, can and a biopsy can detect the eosinophils infiltrating into the area, but can't detect the yeast. So the best way to try to determine whether or not you've got a yeast issue in the stomach or esophagus, in my opinion, is a stool analysis is one of the best ways. My ears have been clogged since COVID and 21. I've literally done everything you can think of to try to resolve it. Ear candling um, done. I don't know how you how you did you found yeast in the ears, but I'm not doubting that. But um, you know, sometimes people confuse yeast for sebum or or cerumen wax. Food tests showed candida and so did the urine test, but it was low. I went dairy-free, sugar-free, gluten-free, soy-free, alcohol-free, and no processed food for almost a year. I avoid, you're, you're probably, Diane, you're probably in mold. Don't, I, you know, I can't say for certain, just with the small amount of information you've, you've given me, but a lot of times with chronic, you know, with chronic ear fluid retention like that, um, there's environmental mold. And so what that's doing is that it's weakening your immune system and then it's allowing mold to colonize the inner ear canal. This is actually what happened to my dog when, when my family and I were, we were in mold for, for several years. We were, in, we were in chronic mold until it, it came to a head and really started to destroy, you know, it killed one of my dogs and, and almost killed my wife uh, and made me, made me relatively, um, and I won't say terribly sick, but it did make me sick because I wasn't in it as much as the rest of my family. But my dog, point being my dog had um, massive yeast overgrowth in the ears that would not go away. We threw everything we could throw at it. And when we got out of the mold and then we threw things at it. Um, and what did we use for, for my dog? We used caprylic acid uh, and we used yeast shield. I actually gave my dog yeast shield. Now I'm not a vet, so don't take this as veterinarian advice, but um, that's what we did for my dog. And I also gave him something called immune shield uh, and it cleaned his ears up uh, within a few weeks. But he, we had to be out of the mold for that to work. So if you're struggling with that chronically, it, you know, I you might consider you know, calling up a mold investigator and having them come out and look through your home and see if there's a potential possibility you might have a mold, environmental mold issue. Uh, let's see here. The 
if you can't tolerate ascorbic acid, what can you substitute? So we have we have a type of vitamin C, Kate, called Ultra C, and it's a, not an ascorbic acid. It's a different type of vitamin C that's buffered differently, so you should be able to tolerate that one just fine. Um, Jane says, happy birthday. Thanks, Jane. Do you need to be tested for yeast or can you just treat it based on the symptoms? It's always best to test, in my opinion, because if you, you, know, if you start treating what you think is yeast overgrowth um, and you're not sure whether it is or whether it isn't and you're wrong, you know, now you're taking something maybe that you don't need. And so, um, you know, it's, in my opinion, it's always best to test. I'm just, I'm a fan of testing and not guessing. But some people guess right. So, you know, you could also try it. So you could go either way, but my opinion is always always get, try to get a test first. Um, so Jessica asked about fungus in the toenail, and I think I mentioned earlier, soak that entire toe in peroxide for about 10 minutes. Not peroxide watered down, but about a 3% solution of, of just hydrogen peroxide you buy over the counter you know in the, in the brown jugs and soak that for 10 minutes twice a day um, you know and, and outside of that again a lot of times toenail fungus grows as a result of, of, of a person being immunocompromised or living in mold so so ask those questions too Can CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, contribute to OAB? UTI was ruled out, but I go all the time. Gyne and pelvic floor PT think it may be interstitial cystitis. Also, can yeast cause lumps on the bottom of the feet? You know, I, I would say, I think mean, that's a huge question. Yes is the answer, but just my experience with um, OAB and interstitial cystitis and chronic, uh, in chronic urinary output or increased uh, urinary frequency. You're in an environment that, um, or you're consuming something that your body perceives as poison, and so your kidneys are working harder to help you try to filter your bloodstream, and that's causing increased urinary frequency. And that could be oxalate. And understand that yeast have the ability, if you have colonizing yeast inside of you, they can actually produce oxalates. It's one of the problems with yeast overgrowth is the yeast, a byproduct of yeast metabolism is oxalate. And so, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why a lot of people develop oxalate toxicity or oxalate symptoms and have to go on a low oxalate diet. Um, but also, you know, chronic yeast uh, growth and, and environmental yeast specifically can cause uh, accelerated reaction to histamine, which can increase urinary frequency and cause interstitial cystitis-like symptoms. So you really um, should probably have your body checked for yeast, and you should also you know, consider having your environment in your home or in your workspace checked wherever you spend the majority of your time. Also check for external mold. Do I recommend fasting uh, in the beginning with killing off some yeast? You, you can definitely fast, but one of the problems with fasting in the yeast is if you're trying to take antifungals, a lot of them will make your stomach extremely upset without food, so fasting might, might not help you in that regard. Um, one of the things that I always do on the front end of a yeast overgrowth is, is I have people do what's called a vitamin C flush which is a, a flushing of the bowels to start the process. And so that cleanses and cleans out the bowels uh, very effectively while also giving a lot of vitamin C that supports the immune system's ability to fight. If you saw my show on Tuesday, I talked in depth a little about the antifungal properties of vitamin C and why it's such a powerful uh, support supplement to take. Um, can yeast increase bilirubin levels? Yes, they absolutely can. So there's two types of bilirubin. There's, there's what's called direct and then there's what's called indirect bilirubin. But, but, um, and so the, depending on which one is elevated, um, so, so direct bilirubin um, and indirect bilirubin when your doctor's measuring your blood test can be teased out. So usually they just measure bilirubin and then they don't tell you if it's direct or indirect, it's high. But you want to tease the difference out because Yeast overgrowth is a common cause of elevations in direct bilirubin, not, not as much indirect. 
So, um, you know, you can get that, you know, they can tease out that difference um, and may help you get a better answer. Okay. Is candida contagious? My husband has severe psoriasis, which I'm thinking is yeast overgrowth. I mean, it is if you, you know, if you, for example, if you have sexual intercourse, you know, if a male has a, a sexual intercourse with a female who has yeast overgrowth, she can definitely pass that along. And the same thing with, with open mouth kissing, you know, you can, you can share that um, if you've got yeast overgrowth, you can transfer colonies of yeast from one to the next. So in that way, it can be, it's not contagious in the sense so much that you're in the same room with somebody with a yeast overgrowth. But I would imagine if it's your husband then probably if you're engaged in any kind of marital activity, then, then you may be passing it back and forth. I, I have seen couples pass it back and forth chronically. Uh, and if your husband has psoriasis, which is severe, it could be yeast, but it could, you know, it could be gluten. Psoriasis is an autoimmune condition of the skin, and yeast definitely can contribute to it, but so can other foods, gluten being one of the major ones. Uh, dairy being another one that can largely contribute to psoriatic uh, skin outbreaks. Um, so question coming in about remodeling and got a big exposure to mold. Um, yeah, if that happens to you, you know, question, I think a follow-up question to that was what can I take after having a big exposure to mold? Um, Mycobinder. We can put a link of that up, Beverly and Jamie, to, to Mycobinder. And, and so if you're trying to, because what happens when you get big exposure, bolus exposure, especially like black mold, black mold produces a type of toxin called trichothecene. It's a family of toxins that are damaging to your brain, that are damaging to your kidneys, damaging to your liver. They're known carcinogens. Um, and you want them out of you. And the problem with mycotoxins is a lot of times they will recirculate as you're trying to push them out, your bile will bind to them and take them back to the liver because you reabsorb about 75% of bile in the small and distal small intestine. So um, using a binding agent like mycobinder will, will kind of help pull that out through your poop so that, so that it binds that, that toxin and helps your body eliminated appropriately. So that's something that you can take after, after environmental mold exposure. Yeah, we're going to do so a lot of questions now coming in about mold because we're talking about mold and yeast, but we're, we've got a show coming up. It's part, I believe it's part four. I think we've done three parts at this point. Maybe it's two um, on mold, comprehensive mold. Uh, shows so that, you know again deeper than just the yeast growing on the human or in the human, but talking about environmental mold and mold detoxification. So be patient with me, because we've got we've got an entire show planned for that. For those of you who are curious about mold, how do vegetables play into the carbohydrate load for feeding yeast? Not so much. We're not worried about the carbohydrate from vegetables unless you're talking about. Uh, like a starchy vegetable like a potato, uh, which is very easily broken down into sugar and, and, and feeding of, of yeast in the bodies. But if you're talking about like dark leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables, we're not worried about that type of carbohydrate load for feeding yeast. So what happens if you avoid most of the food you mentioned? My daughter's on a limited diet, so one thing she does eat is rice. Quick, you got to, I mean, if she's gluten, one, if she's gluten sensitive, she, you know, you got to get the rice out. Two, if you're trying to overcome yeast overgrowth, rice isn't doing you any favors. It's going to perpetuate it. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to look at that a little bit more carefully if, if it's something that she's struggling with. Can symptoms of Sjogren's syndrome be confused with yeast overgrowth? Well, yeast is an inducer of autoimmune disease. It's one of the four categorical triggers of an autoimmune process. And so Sjogren's being an autoimmune process of the tear ducts and the, and the salivary glands and the, and the oral cavity, um, you know, it's possible. Now, there are other triggers, but yeast can be a trigger. So, so it's something definitely that if you've got that diagnosis, you want to work with your doctor to rule it out, rule yeast out as a potential trigger.
Let's see here. Do you have a supp okay, so do I have a supplement to stop yeast over? We've got a whole battery. One of the things we can put up a, a link to to Annette is um, our yeast bundle, and it's a mixture of, of uh, different things that you might find very helpful. But caprylic acid along with a, a multi-spectrum uh, herbal and um, a specialized type of probiotic that competes with yeast. So Mark says, two of my jabbed and boosted rice, I assume you mean Rice University, Rice classmates recently died suddenly from heart attacks. They didn't smoke, ate healthy food, and exercised. Was it mold, yeast, fungus, or sugar that killed them? Is that a trick question? I'd say if they were jabbed and, and died of a heart attack, uh, it could be the jab and one of the side effects. We're seeing a lot of that these days. Um, but if, if you're talking about classmates, one of the things I do see, you know, in, in older dorms, they're, they're, a lot of the older dorm rooms on college campuses are rife with mold. So um, it's not uncommon to see college students go off to college and get very, very sick as a result of a mold overgrowth in their dorm room, in which case, you know, that, that could have been affecting their health as well. Can yeast overgrowth affect your eyes? Yes. Uh, it absolutely can affect the eyes. Uh, do you have an eye formula? Yes, we do. We, we have an eye formula. I believe it's, uh, we put a link up to the eye formula uh, for um, DD. Okay. Let's go down on the far left too. So Deanne, so from what I can understand, candida can go hand in hand with mycotoxins in mold. So if you're supposed to limit sugar intake, wouldn't unsweetened coconut flakes be considered too much sugar even though it contains caprylic acid? Possibly. Where I see people go wrong with coconut is not eating you know, coconut as, as the, the, the fruit per se itself or the nut itself, but it's, um, it's the coconut water because it's like a sugar bomb. I actually had one, one year, this is a couple years ago, the young lady, she was drinking like 12 coconut waters a day and it started to rot her teeth out because of the high sugar concentration. So even though there's caprylic acid in coconut, coconut, yes, can have uh, heavy carbohydrate when you're eating it in a processed form. So the, the actual whole co coconut itself, I would be less concerned with as I would be with some of the processed byproduct of coconut. How do you get rid of, so I think I answered that one already. Um, would you take, so somebody's asking if I would take antibiotics for H. pylori. And the answer to that is it, me personally, if you're asking me, me personally, no, I wouldn't. Uh, there are plenty of things that, that can be done naturally um, to reestablish healthy microbiome in an H. pylori you know, scenario, one of them um, being zinc. Um, zinc, probiotics, um, uh, bismuth or natural forms of bismuth can, can be very effective. Um, mucilaginous, so, so things that create a mucilaginous layer, a mucus layer um, to help soothe the stomach. So, so things like aloe and deglycerinized licorice, licorice. I mean, there are just a lot of things that can be done in that situation that, in my opinion, don't necessarily merit antibiotics. A lot of people I've seen over the years you know, have been on triple therapy for H. pylori and it failed them. It, it actually made them worse. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's not a guarantee. Antibiotics are not a guarantee there. Let's see here. No, 
not a question. Not a question, a lot of commentary. So what do you think about root canals and keeping a tooth that occasionally creates a fistula? Does the infection stay local? No, it can go systemic. I'm not a fan of root canals. I, I mean, if I were faced with a root canal, I'd probably remove the tooth and put in an implant. Um, you know, or I would, at the very least, I would see a biological dentist and get a really, maybe a, one or two different opinions um, from, a you know, from a traditional style practice dentist. Uh, let's see, would 86% would chocolate affect yeast? Well, I mean, if the chocolate is 86% cocoa, but it has sugar in it, I, you know, again, added processed sugar, I wouldn't eat it. Um, you know, when you're going, trying to get rid of yeast, it's 100% sugar-free, no added sugar anywhere. That doesn't mean you can't eat some fruit. That's not what I mean by added sugar. What I mean by added sugar is the processed sugars from fruits or things like beet or cane or corn, those have to be out because you don't want to feed the beast. Uh, did, we put up the, did we put up that I formula focus? Yes. Okay. So we put that TC, we put that formula up in the in the link for or in the um, feed for you. Um, but as far as symptoms of, of yeast overgrowth from the eyes perspective, for a lot of people, it's vision loss. Um, their eyes start to get super blurry, and almost overnight, it's like it's like um, their distance vision can become very problematic. So so if you have like rapid onset of vision loss, you know suspect yeast or mold. Because um, that's a major contributor to, to the damage to the nerve that feeds the eye, the cranial nerve that feeds the eye. Um, can poop bacteria transplant fix H. pylori like they do in extreme cases of C. diff? I don't know. I, I, I haven't, don't have any experience there, Teresa. And so I, I, it wouldn't be, I, if I gave you an answer, it wouldn't be from any kind of knowledge or experience. Um, usually H. pylori is, is colonizing and aggressively colonizing the esophagus and stomach. So I wouldn't imagine that a, a distal bacterial transplant or fecal transplant given through the rectum would potentially affect what's happening in the stomach to the greatest of degrees. But, you know, that might be a, a better answer. I actually have a doctor that I'm, I've got coming on because she runs a lab out in Cal, research lab out in California where they do a ton of these. And so we're, she's going to be one of our guests coming up. So maybe we'll table that question for her because it's just not something I, I feel like I'm, I'm the expert about that I could give you a great answer. I'm a diabetic type one with low white count. I have developed a major ongoing challenge with ingrown hairs, boils on my legs. Dermatologists suggest sugar intake is naturally a concern. Do you potentially have any significant recommendations for me to implement to help stop the sores? You, well, I mean, there's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really complex question, but I would say first and foremost, if you're a type 1 diabetic, type 1 diabetes is autoimmune. So you've got an autoimmune reaction against the beta cells in your pancreas. And there are two primary triggers for type 1 diabetes, actually three that we're aware of. Number one is vaccine. Number two is dairy, um, especially A1 dairy. And then number three is gluten. So you should be free of those things as a start with your diet. Now, if you're not currently grain-free already, you know, you're injecting insulin or taking insulin regularly, you really wanna pay close attention to that, your blood sugar, because a lot of times type one, type one diabetics find that when they go grain-free, they need far less insulin and their blood sugars are dramatically better controlled. So you have to pay, just pay attention if you're changing your diet to your insulin need in that way. Could an EMF cause someone to not be able to rid themselves of internal fungal yeast infection? So I don't think anybody's really studied this to the level in humans to answer that question definitively, Mary. But I think what we could say, though, is that EMFs can, you know, we've seen studies and research in, in 
in, in petri dishes where EMF exposure to yeast propagates their growth. In other words, it makes them grow stronger and makes them grow more populated. So um, theoretically, yes, that would work the same way in humans. And so EMF exposure could be a, a potential exacerbating factor for persistent yeast. Okay. Let's go down on the, on the Tuesday middle. Can you recommend tests? We can ask um, our general doctors to perform to test for various yeast overgrowth. So, you know, there's stool testing that can be done where they do what's called a culture in microscopy. There's blood tests that you can have done that measure antibody response. And um, so those are ones that they'll probably know about. You know, beyond that, it's swabs. So if it's oral thrush, you, you know, you can, you, if it's bad enough, you can, you could say you pretty much know that it's yeast because it, it has an appearance. Um, but you can culture, you know, swab of the mouth and you can culture, um, you can culture as well the, the vaginal canal if, if you suspect vaginal overgrowth of yeast. And those are, again, those are all tests that, that doctors can order um, when you go visit them. So somebody's asking about grass-fed beef or lamb's meat or organ, organs increasing LDL, lipid, lipoprotein, which is a low-density lipoprotein, which is what doctors oftentimes refer to as bad cholesterol. And I, I, I just, I'm just going to put it like this. Who cares? LDL is not a risk factor for disease. And I know I'm, I'm probably, you know, scoffing in the face of the vast majority of cardiologists, but... Really, frankly, I don't care. LDL type C, which is bad, oftentimes referred to as bad cholesterol, what we know about that cholesterol is that people that have higher levels of it live longer. So why ever would we try to lower it or be concerned about something in our diet as long as we're not sick, um, something in our diet raising that, that level? I don't, I don't subscribe to the theory because uh, it's just that. It's a theory, and it's a wrong theory, uh, the cholesterol hypothesis theory is just that. It's a theory that has been very misleading, and if it were accurate, then, then lowering cholesterol over the past 40 plus years would have led to less heart attacks and strokes, and it hasn't. So, you know, empirically, the theory doesn't hold water, and then scientifically, uh, the longevity studies don't validate it. Uh, let's see here. Can I take yeast shield and the mycobinder together? Yeah, but don't take them at the same time. You can take them, you know, on the same day, but but you know, the mycobinder you need to really want it. You want to take that on an empty stomach, um, which is you know a good hour before or after meals, and then the yeast shield you can take with food. But you can take them at the same time on the, but just not together on you know. But you can take them in the same day. Yeah, so Jean comments that she's having uh, two root canals, the first of two root canals removed, prepping for implants. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll pray for you during, during that because I know that's not, not a fun thing to have to do. But in my opinion, root canals are an ar archaic and antiquated form of, of dentistry. I mean, there may be exceptions, albeit very rare ones. I, I just don't recommend leaving dead tissue in your body that can mitigate infection. It's just not, not a smart thing to do. And if you think about what you're doing, that's what a root canal is, is you're killing the tooth and leaving that dead tooth there. And dead material, dead organic material decays. Now bone takes longer to decay, so it may not decay quite as quickly as say an infected you know, skin rash, but it still nonetheless will decay and it's decaying in your mouth. Uh, let's see. What if you have, Susan wants to know, what if you have the, the DAO and histamine gene variants? So gene variants don't mean you don't clear histamine. Those variants don't mean that at all. And I've seen this come to fruition. The best way to know, Susan, whether or not, so, so ignore the variants and measure the actual DAO and measure the actual histamine and tryptase because 
the gene variant doesn't dictate that that you're not going to clear histamine it may it may put you at a disadvantage but it doesn't mean that you can't do it so don't rely heavily on those genetic tests to 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 ascertain whether or not that's part of your problem um, because again uh, a histamine reactivation type syndrome or mast cell activation syndrome a lot of times has nothing to do with the genetic variant so much as it has to do with environmental poisoning um, in, in, in the largest case is, is the chronicity of mold exposure. Okay. I think we covered it. Man, did we get through all the questions? We're six minutes over. But I think I started six minutes late. All right. I think we're going to wrap it. It's 135, 136. And... Um, yeah, I think I'm going to go eat lunch now. I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Don't forget to take advantage of our Labor Day sale. Um, celebrate is the promo code. Celebrate, just like it's spelled. And so um, you can go over to Gluten Free Society and shop and take advantage of any of those things. And it's our biggest discount of the year. Of the year. So if you've been debating or on the fence about trying any, any of our products or maybe doing genetic testing, uh, to determine whether or not going gluten-free is a good move for you. You know, that's all there. You can save money while you do it. And thanks for all the wonderful birthday wishes. We will see you next Tuesday for a very special episode, a birthday episode of the Dr. Osborne Zell. And I'm going to be sharing 50 years of wisdom with you. So hope to see you next Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Take care.